it. So, hey, I want to give you a little bit of a, I want to give a little bit of a history lesson, hopefully, today. And maybe you guys can help me out. I'm going to pull out some old items, and maybe you guys will know what they are, and maybe you won't. But anybody know what these are? What are they? CDs. Compact disc, right? How, how many of you have a CD player at home? A few, right on. Wow, there you go. CD players at home, right? In my car, I still have a CD player. Here's some CDs. Anybody know what this is? Yeah. yeah. If you're under 30, you may not. If you're under 20, you may not know what this is. This is a map. Someone said first service. Is that Africa? No, it's not Africa. <laughs> How many of you still use paper maps? Right, a few. Gary back there gave me this map. Gary likes his paper map. He said, don't rip that. I'm going to use it. So you know you have a... Anyways, uh, so this right here, right, you know, that's a map. Let me show you. Anybody know what? Anybody use these anymore? Yeah. <laughs> legal pad. Anybody got grocery lists on, on, on the legal pad, right? Um, how about this now? This is... Yeah. I used to, I used to sell phone book ads and... Um, and well, I don't do that anymore. Thank you, Jesus. But <laughs> does it, did anybody use a phone book in the last six months? Wow, first service there was a hand or two. So just, <laughs> you guys are the cooler one. This is a uh, concordance that I use uh, to study, like look up things for scripture. What about this? Come on. <laughs> there was, I was surprised at this question. How many of you have a landline at home? Joel, really? Wow, really? You guys have a landline? All right, a few of you. That's great. That's great. I guess that's so cool. So, um, I got some books here. Like, I got some really good books. And then this thing is probably my favorite up here. You know what this is? <laughs> Super Mario Brothers, right? How about Duck Hunt? And then, do you guys remember the pad? I was talking about the, the running pad. Well, oh, man. Oh, we were sweating. You guys, anybody know what we're talking about? The pad? Yeah. Okay, right, they laid out, corded, man, you're running, and <laughs> so fun. Anyways, this is, this is awesome, but what I, what I brought all this stuff out for today was that it's amazing that everything on here and a whole lot more is now found in one location, and most of you have them in your pocket, in your phone. Everything here that is big and bulky and at one time took a lot of effort to learn how to read a map, use a phone, look up things, phone book, so much more is all in one location right here. Title of the message today is, It's All in Him. Listen, anything you need is in Him. I want to explore this idea of what is actually in Him and how that can benefit our life. Would you pray with me this morning? God, we just thank you for what you're going to do today what you're going to speak to our hearts, what you're going to speak to our souls, and how you change us from the inside out. We trust in you, and we thank you for making a difference in our life today. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. 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 When I was a kid, I grew up talking about, like, I made lists, and I made lists for my whole life. Like, when I was growing up, they always said, I grew up in church, and they always said, you know, Jesus should be the important, and, and it, it, the, the most important, or God should be the most important in your life, and, you know, always should be the most important, and then your family, and then your job, and so the list kind of looked like this, right? You've got your family, you've got your career, and then finally you got it goes eggs, right? So season starts here shortly, even though we lost by 19, it's okay. Um, uh, it, was, it was preseason, so it doesn't matter. It just goes away. So, um, but I, I, I kind of made this list in my life, just naturally. Okay, well, God's always going to come first, but then, you know, I, I keep my family, and then it's my job, you know, my hobbies, what, whatever your list is. But then when I was a kid, my youth pastor at the time, very influential in my life, he, I don't know what happened there, sorry. <laughs> um, he, he told me, he says, don't have a list anymore. He says, Jesus wants to be a part of your whole life. And think of it as a circle. And Jesus is in the middle. And he wants to be a part of your hobbies. He wants to be a part of your relationships. Like Jesus wants to be in your career. Jesus wants to be in your school. 
Jesus wants to be in every part of your family. And yeah, he wants to be with you when the Seahawks lose and when the Mariners screw it up again and when the Zags win a national championship this year. And sorry, I get a little excited about the Zags. So Jesus, Jesus wants to be a part of everything. So throw your list away. Make it a circle, a perfect circle, if you will, and, and put him a part of everything because that's what he cares about. He loves it. He wants to go camping with you. He wants to be in your marriage. He wants to be in your neighborhood when you go on bike rides and you're out at your workouts and you're, you know, floating the river in 40 degrees, Scott. Like he wants to be with you every part of your life. And so that's our encouragement today. And we had recovery on Thursday night. How many were recovery on Thursday night? That was amazing. Um, coin night was so, so cool. Some great stories. Six months clean and sober. 35 years clean and sober. Like, it is just encouraging. You missed coin night. Come at this one. It's on the 17th, I think is what you said. It's the Thursday before Thanksgiving. So come out for that. It's going to be powerful. Absolutely amazing. But everything you ever need is in Jesus. And Joel did our giving talk, and he read a great scripture in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 17. Actually, it's the verse of the day in the Bible app today, if you have that and you look at that. Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Whatever you do, do it in the name of Jesus. And as we trust in him, we can realize this simple fact that it's all in him. Paul, one of the greatest heroes of our faith, wrote most of the New Testament. He writes in the book of Colossians, excuse me, in the book of Acts chapter 17, he writes this. He said, he is the God who made the world and everything in it. Since he is Lord of heaven and earth, he doesn't live in man-made temples. So God's not confined to church. God's not confined to any situation. He's a part of anything and everything. Next verse. And human hands can't serve his needs, for he has no needs. He himself gives life and breath to everything, and he satisfies every need. He is not far from any one of us. And that, that'll preach right there. He's not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move, and exist. Paul says, it's all about Jesus. It's all in him. God in human form, it's all in Jesus. For in him, we live, and move, and exist. One of our, one of the translations says, and have our being. We used to sing songs about that. In him we live, and, anyways, I won't go there, but, but everything, (laughs) that we need is in him. So I want to break down this verse a little bit, and I want to highlight those three words. In him we live. And what does that actually mean? So the Greek word live there is actually defined like this. It says, um, sorry, you put that, yes, sorry. Be alive, not lifeless, not dead. How many of you know you can be alive physically, but you can be dead? That's why sometimes they'll say, I went to a dead church. Like, (laughs) I'm so thankful that Northbridge is a live church, baby. Yeah. I'm so thankful to be in a house with you guys. It's just so much fun. But to be alive, so Paul is saying, I am in Jesus. I am alive in Jesus. I, I live in Jesus. So many times we live in our job. We live in our family. We live in our kids. And many of you are in this season or have been in this season. Angie and I, are, uh, Lexi is cheerleading and in volleyball and had her birthday on Tuesday. So she had a birthday party this weekend. And Bodie is um, playing flag football. And it's like, we go nonstop. I'm telling you, every night of the week is a practice or something. I'm like, can we just take a breath? Like, holy cow. Many of you have had it even busier and even crazier. Maybe currently have it busier and crazier. But sometimes we can live in our kids. And then so when that season moves on, what do we have? When our job goes away or COVID happens and things change around our life because we've lived in that, we don't have much. And so Paul says we live in Jesus. And so my question to you today, one of them is, do you live in Jesus? We don't just survive, we live in Jesus. We're alive in Jesus. 
One of the most famous scriptures, John chapter 10 and verse 10. Here's the message translation. It reads this way. The thief is only there to kill, steal, and destroy. So anytime your um, evil life, your addiction life looks a little bit better, just stay. It's only there to kill, steal, and destroy you. But Jesus says, I have come so that you can have, get this, real and eternal life, more and better than, than they, being you and me, have ever dreamed of. And I've dreamed of some big stuff. I've been excited about some big stuff. But Jesus says, I came that you could have a bigger life than that. I'm not going to just survive. I want to thrive in this life. And so my question, if, if struggle is your norm, I wonder if you're living in Jesus. Now, we all struggle. We all face difficult situations. We all go through complications and trials, and sometimes they're seasons long, sometimes they're years long. But my question is, on a whole, if we are living a life of struggle, I'm wondering if we're living in Jesus. And one of the ways I think we know if we're living in Jesus is I wonder what you're speaking to your life. What are you saying about your life? Are are, are you speaking the God's truth? We're going to start a series next week. Gary's kicking us off next week, and it's called The Lies We Believe. So many times we believe things that aren't true, that the devil has whispered to us that I'm not enough, that it's always going to be this way. But the truth of God's word, do you speak this over your life, over your kids, over your health, over your family? Do you speak life? Proverbs 18.21 says, words kill, but they also give life. They're either poison or fruit. You choose. You get to choose what you speak about your life. It's just miserable. I was talking to one of the guys who comes, Mike, uh, comes to first service, and Mike's great. Mike says, I said, how you doing today? He goes, man, getting younger every day. He goes, I'm I'm, I'm not saying this old crap anymore. I'm like, heck yeah. He's choosing to speak life over his life. And so are you speaking life over your life? Because you get to choose. Oftentimes we'll say to our kids, Lexi or Bodie, like, you can choose to listen and be kind to your sister, or you can go spend the evening in your room. You choose. So Jesus' effect, Proverbs is saying this to us. He's saying, you get to speak life or death. You choose. Now have at it. Speak life over your life. Start speaking the word of God over your life, or speak poison and kill your life, because it's your choice. Not trying to be mean or rude, but you get a chance to speak over your life. And so are we living in Jesus? We can begin to speak over our health. Man, I am 100% healthy, healed, and whole. Despite how I feel, I'm 100% healthy, healed, and whole. I'm speaking that over my life in Jesus' name. I'm speaking that over my family. My kids are happy. My kids are fulfilled. My kids are joyful. My kids are excited about eating candy today. Now, you don't have to speak that by faith, but... (laughs) My kids are excited to go to school. They have enough friends. They are smart in their studies. I love my job. I am excited about life. You can speak life to your situation. We don't only live in Jesus. Paul says we live and we move in Jesus. We move in Jesus. It's not not in our strength. It's in the strength of the one who died on the cross for us. So when you make decisions in your life, When you move, it should be in Jesus. The Greek word, the definition of that Greek word move is to set in motion, to move, remove, right? Sometimes you got to remove some stuff to move on, excite and stir up. And that'll preach right there. That's exciting. In Jesus, I move. I make my decisions in my life. When you're faced with something at work, when you're faced with something um, financially, you got to make some decisions, like you got to change careers, you got to, you got to, you know, move your living situation from your house, you're moving from apartments to whatever the situation is. When you're moving, do you ask God, I'm going to move in you, or do you move on your own strength and your own wisdom? I live in Jesus, and I also will move in Jesus. And so for me, I've got to learn to do three things. I've got to learn to stop, listen, and then move. So many times I go fast. If you, don't, if you know me, I'm, I'm highly energized, I'm emotional, and I go really fast a lot. And so I'm thankful to have Gary in my life and my wife in my life who will often say, slow down, 
right? You don't have to bite the whole apple in one bite. Like, take a breath, and we can move slowly. So I need to learn to stop and hear the voice of God. It says, be still and know that I am God. So when I'm moving in Jesus, it doesn't always look like it's a million miles an hour. Work hard, go, go fast at times, but when you're making a decision, man, step back and say, okay, God, I'm gonna live in you and I'm gonna move in you and I'm gonna make decisions based on your voice. James 1.5, I referenced this earlier. If you need wisdom, ask our generous God. Man, our God is generous. He gives and he loves with generosity. Ask our generous God and he will give it to you. If you need to know what to do, how to move, we're going to ask God. We're going to live in God. Finally, we live and we move, but we also exist in God. We had, uh, one translation, like I said, says we have our being. And so the Greek definition of this word exist is simply I am. I am. And so I want to ask you today, do you know who you are? Do you know who you are? Do you know who, what God calls you in Scripture? Because the world will call you something different. Culture will call you something different. The enemy, who sounds a lot like yourself on the inside a lot, will tell you you're dumb, you're not good enough, you're ugly, you're not smart enough. But Scripture says this. Scripture says you're loved. You're accepted. You're his kid. Man, I remember the day I, I realized that I was God's kid. Like, man, I'm his kid, and a dad loves his kids. I love my kids. And I'm not the perfect dad, but he is the perfect dad. I'm his kid. I'm chosen. Now, that's hard for our brain to comprehend that we're chosen, but God picked you. Now, we can't pick everybody all at one time. Like, that's not humanly possible, but God's not human. God's God. And so realize it. Okay, I'm special, and I'm chosen. Like, on the playground, when you were the last picked, like me, at basketball, when you were the last picked, that's not God. You're the first picked. You're the best player on the team because God chose you. And if you can't comprehend that, just live by faith and say, God, okay, you chose me. You chose me. I'm your workmanship. A workman puts time, effort, and energy into his craft. And God put effort and energy into you. You're more than a conqueror. Whatever it is you're facing, God doesn't just say you're a conqueror. No, you're more than a conqueror. Like this is who you are. This is what it is for us to know this, that I live, move, and exist in Jesus. This is who I am. This is who I am. And everything I do and live and define myself by is found in in him. Dalton preached at recovery a couple weeks ago, and he said this. He said, um, he reminded us that we're not human doings. We're human beings. So are you being in him? Because everything you need is in him. So now that we know who we're in and how to kind of live in Jesus, I want to give you a few more points of what he is so we can go to him when we need something. And first and foremost, Jesus is your relationship. He is our relationship. First and foremost, this is the most important relationship. He is. So he has this conversation with two ladies by the name of Mary and Martha. He goes over to their house. And Martha is busy. Martha's like working. She's trying hard to put trunk or treat together. She's trying hard to um, make sure the kids have their lunches. She's trying really hard to make sure the job is in order and is in line and that the promotion happens when it should and that the, the husband has the lunch and cleans up the house and that the, the wife makes sure she does the car, filling up the car gas right. Like it's so busy. She's a picture of us trying to do everything. But Mary's just hanging with Jesus and Martha gets mad. Like will you help, will you tell her Will you tell her to come and help me? Be like, I can't wash all these dishes by myself, Jesus. I can't do all these things by myself. I need some help, will you tell her? But Jesus' reply to her in Luke chapter 10 and verse 41, it says, but the Lord said to her, my dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. You are so worried about everything. There's only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary's discovered it. Mary's hanging with me. Mary's got relationship with me. 
For us to realize everything is in him, Jesus just says, I want your relationship, and I will not take that away from you. Get in scripture. Just read some Bible and spend some time with Jesus. Put on some worship music and just spend some time with Jesus. That's the one thing worth being concerned about, is relationship with Jesus. He is our relationship. He's also our rest. He's also our rest. The book of Hebrews says it this way, Hebrews chapter four and verse nine. So there is a special rest still waiting for the people of God. If you're feeling frustrated, worried, and you don't have a life of rest, there's a special rest waiting for you. Verse 10 says, for all who have entered into God's rest have rested from their labors just as God did after creating the world. Verse 11, so let us, me and you, do our best to enter that rest. I was trying to think of what that means. Like, what does it mean for us to rest in Jesus? He's our relationship, but he's also our rest. And so the other day we were driving down the road, Lexi and I, and um, she wants to uh, learn how to sing a little bit better. And I don't know why she turns to me to uh, learn how to sing. Uh, uh, Angie used to listen to me sing as a kid, and she's like, man, I did not like your voice for the longest time in the world. <laughs> Then I went to college and I learned how to sing a little bit better. So Lexi's asking me, how do, how do I sing on key? And so she's trying to work out how to sing on key the best she can. And so we're in the car the other day and she's singing really, really loud above the music. And she says, am I on? And so we're kind of trying to work out how to get her on key and find the right songs. And so then I, 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 I tried this with her and it, and, and it helped her. And so I'm hoping this will get us an idea of uh, what it is to rest. Doesn't work for you. That's okay. We'll move on in a second. But when... Lexi is singing. I said, I want you to just close your eyes and I want you to listen to the music. Listen first and then sing. So you're singing with the music. You're not singing above the music. Oftentimes we'll just go and I'll just sing a song and I think I know it and then it's off key and it's really bad. You've heard that happen on multiple occasions up here on a Sunday morning. But when Lexi I told her to just be quiet and listen and then sing. She began to sing on key a little bit easier and a little bit better. And so that's our life with Jesus. I want you to go to work, but I want you to let God work through you to this week. Okay, God, I'm gonna sit back and I'm gonna listen to your voice. And I'm gonna see what do you want me to do? Oh, you want me to have a conversation with somebody? Okay, maybe I can do that. Oh, I'm gonna look at this file. I'm gonna do this for the... Um, the employer. I don't, I don't know. I'm going to rest in you. I'm going to step back and I'm going to look at it a little different. God, I'm going to let you direct my path because he's my relationship, but he's also my rest. And if you find yourself full of worry, full of doubt, I want to read you a scripture that will hopefully give you some rest today. Isaiah chapter 54, verse nine. This was a verse of the day, like on Monday, I think. It was awesome. My covenant of blessing. This is God speaking to his people. He says, my covenant of blessing will never be broken, says the Lord, who has mercy on you. Verse, next verse. Is there a next verse? Let me just read this to you. Be, sorry, just Isaiah chapter 54 and verse nine. Just as I swore in the time of Noah that I would never again let let a flood cover the earth. So now I swear that I will never again be angry and punish you. For the mountains may move and the hills disappear, but even then my faithful love for you will still remain. My covenant of blessing will never be broken, says the Lord, who has mercy on you. Now you can rest in the fact that his covenant still stands with you. His love still stands for you. He's your relationship. He is your rest. He's also our refuge. When the mountains are too high and the valleys are too low and the waters are too high, he is our place of refuge. Psalms 46, verses one says, God is our refuge and strength. He's always ready to help in times of trouble. So we will not fear when earthquakes come and the mountains crumble into the sea. Where, where do you go when things are scary? Where do you go when things are hard? You run to Jesus. You run to God because he will take care of you. I, um, almost a year ago on Thanksgiving Eve, uh, we had our 
Thanksgiving Eve gathering, which we will do as well this year. It's a great time for us to come and just be thankful together, worship together a little bit if you can make it. It's, a, it's one, of, one of our favorite the, the whole year. Um, and anyways, we went to service and it was great. Had a great time with everybody. Went home and went to bed a little bit later than usual. And Bodhi woke up in the middle of the night crying because he couldn't breathe very well. And uh, so we went in and tried to comfort him. And, and it, it got apparent that we needed to go to emergency because he was having trouble catching his breath. And obviously, Angie and I are um, keeping it together a little, um, but our, we were keeping it together. We were ke- Angie was um, keeping it together. <laughs> but there was a lot of fear. There was a lot of scared. There was a lot of worry happening. Um, our, our boy couldn't breathe. We didn't know what was going. So I jump in the car, and from, from our house to, we went to Sacred Heart was um, about, I don't know, 25 minutes or so. And so you don't have a lot of time when your son can't breathe. And so he's, he's breathing, but it's really scary. So he's in the back of the seat, and man, I'm, you know, I'm trying to comfort him, trying to be strong, tough dad, but man, in the side, I'm, I'm, I'm a wreck. I'm an absolute wreck. And I remember the point, I was on the freeway right about Pines, and I remember the point where I felt incredibly angst, worried, and scared. But I think I was about ready to preach on something like this, and I thought, maybe I should listen to what I'm gonna preach on. And I began to pray and just thank God. Okay, God, you're my refuge. And I'm not feeling great right now, but I'm going to trust you. And in that moment, I felt just an overwhelming peace that has never felt before in the middle of struggle, in the middle of worry, because God is my refuge. You know, sometimes we think that the hospital, like when I get to the hospital, they'll take care of him. It's good. We think that the hospital's our refuge. We think that enough money in the bank is our refuge. The security of a good company with 401k and right benefits is is our refuge. We think that when I get married, that's my refuge. Or when I, whatever your refuge is, we think it's that. But the only true refuge is Jesus. That's why in the middle of stuff in your life, you can have peace because he is your refuge. It's all in him. Everything you need is found in him. He's your refuge. And finally today, he's your reason. He's our reason. He's our relationship, our rest, our refuge. He's also our reason. He's the reason we do everything. You think sometimes that you go to work because you need a paycheck and that's a part of the reason, but man, you're doing it for Jesus. You're having your family for Jesus. Trunk or treat is fun and candy, but we're doing it for Jesus. Your whole reason in your life is for Jesus. It's all in him. Colossians chapter two and verse 10, it says, for in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. So Christ, God, in the Trinity, in the Holy Spirit, same person, yet they're three separate people. For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in, humani- or in the human body. So you also are complete through your union with Christ, who is the head over every ruler and authority. You think the government's ruling you? No, God is. You think you're ruling your life? No, God is. It's all in him. Paul said it, right? We read it already, Acts chapter 17. He's not, he's not far from you, for in him we live and move and exist. There's a great story in the book of John. I didn't mention this in the first gathering, but it's really cool. There's a great story in the book of John where Jesus says some hard things to people. Not everything's gonna be perfect and pleasing to the ears sometimes when God has to call us out on some stuff maybe, but he says some stuff that's a little bit questionable and weird in the book of John, and then some of his disciples run away. They walk away. And then Jesus turns to his 12 and says, are you guys gonna leave? And Peter replies with this in John chapter 6 and verse 68. He says, Lord, where would we go? You have the words that give eternal life. Everything I need, God, is in you. Where else am I going to go? It's all in him. Everything. Would you bow your heads and pray with me?